We're starting a new series. We're going to do something for the next, I don't know, six to eight weeks maybe or more. I don't know how it's going to go, but we're starting a series of sermons and um, we're calling it Called, and it's about what it means to be called by God and to have a calling. So that was all brought to you by the Ministry of Redundancy. For those of you. <laughs> um, what does it mean to be called by God? Well, how does that change our life? How does that change how we live? That's what we're going to take a look at. And I volunteered yet again to be first because that way I get the options, all of them, um, instead of having to clean up and figure out what I can preach on at the end. But I wanted to share with you something that God's been kind of working with me on from Exodus 3 and 4. So if you brought a Bible and you feel like pulling one of those out, we're going to look at Exodus 4 in particular, um, the first 17 verses. And as you maybe are thumbing your way to that location or hitting it up on your phone, <laughs> no. Totally new era. I'm so not ready for it. Um, I want to share with you just a quick story that has really spoken to me about what it means to be in this journey of faith. Um, in the late 1800s, there was a vessel that had headed out from Portugal, so Europe, and it was heading down and around to South America, quite a jaunt at that point. And um, as they were sailing up the coast of Brazil, there was a crisis. They were running out of fresh water. So they had to switch to rationing and everybody was getting a little bit of water and even so people were suffering terribly they were getting more and more dehydrated and they thought all oh, hope is lost um, just at the point where they were about to run out they finally saw a ship and they sent out a message to it um, saying is there any way that you could spare some fresh water the answer that they got back was put down your buckets they had uh, unknowingly sailed right into the mouth of the Amazon River, which was a fresh water source. And what they had, what they needed in order to get through their journey, in order to accomplish their goal, was all around them, but they were stuck thinking that all we have is what's on our boat. Um, they literally had everything they needed to thrive all around them. They were actually sitting in it and didn't even realize it. I don't know about you, but I come in here on a number of Sundays feeling worn thin, worn out, uh, not equipped to thrive, feeling equipped to kind of get through and to get through another week, and I kind of hope that worship will be a shot in the arm and I'll get a good breath of God in my lungs so that I can keep focused and keep moving forward. But I think that a lot of that has to do with me working out of my reserves rather than God's reserves. Um, God has a lot more, and sometimes we need a little message from outside of our own ship to remind us of the truth that God uh, wants to give us an abundant life, that uh, if we turn to him, if we, if we truly take in this thought that has been shared already in worship, that God is with us, Emmanuel, and that there is plenty for us to move into. So with that, we're going to move into kind of Exodus, and John has been doing a great job of bringing up questions lately from Scripture um, and how God uses questions to kind of shift our attention and to make us think a little bit differently. And, and I wanted to stay in that vein with a question from Exodus 4, and it's the question, uh, what is in your hand? And so I'm going to read for you an account from Exodus 4, 1 through 17. This occurs right after the burning bush. The burning bush gets Moses' attention. He goes over, he hears God's voice out of it, and the voice says, you know, I want you to set my people free. And then this is what happens. So... Exodus 4. Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me? And they say, The Lord did not appear to you. And the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. And the Lord said, Throw it on the ground. And Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake. And he ran from it. And the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out his hand, and he took the snake. And it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. And then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, the skin was leprous, white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. And then the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. And if they don't believe these two signs, 
Take some water from the Nile, pour it out on dry ground, and the water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. And Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant, and slow of speech and tongue. And the Lord said to him, Who gives human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. But Moses said, Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. And then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother, Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well, and he's already on his way to meet you, and he will be very glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth, and I will help both of you speak, and I will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth, as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so that you can perform the mighty signs with it. With that, let's pray. God, um, thank you for your word. Thank you that you meet us here and that you are indeed with us. And Lord, right now I ask for nothing short of that that you would be with us, that you would bring things to our minds and to our hearts that would speak to us, Lord. Help us as we consider this text together to have a fresh word from you that can bring us into what it means to be called to you. Lord, thanks for loving us, and we love you too. Amen. So Moses, he was a pretty extraordinary guy. He lived an extraordinary life. Um, a little backstory about him. He had barely escaped the genocide of all the male babies of the Hebrews. Um, and then he was given an opportunity to grow up in the palace of Pharaoh. So that's a little bit of his story. And as he was kind of living out the story, uh, he saw something that bugged him. He saw his own people, the Hebrews, suffering under slavery of, of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And, and he decided that I have to do something. And in response, he kind of went off impulsively and he killed an Egyptian who was beating up a Hebrew slave. Someone saw the murder. And he realized, I'm a wanted man. And he fled into exile. That's our hero from Scripture. And by the way, I love the fact that the heroes in Scripture are kind of flawed people. They don't have it all together. Uh, one of the heroes of the faith is a guy who was a murderer and who then spent 40 years taking care of sheep in the middle of the desert because he was scared. So, if he's qualified to be called, maybe we are too. And that's kind of encouraging to me. Um, now, mistakes in Moses' past, the failures that he had had, and uh, the ways that affected him, I think Moses gave, kind of gave up on this passion. He had tried to live into this, uh, this passion that he had for his people, and instead he found himself in a position where he was tending sheep. Um, and that gradually squeezed out the dream over 40 days, forty years of wandering around in the desert taking care of a bunch of sheep. And then God shows up in a burning bush, calls him to leave this life of shepherding and to move back into this passion that he had kind of given up. <clears throat> now, I would think Moses would be stoked about this. You know? Like, Really? I can go back, I can be among my people, I always had a heart for them, thanks for inviting me back, God, I'm so excited to see what you're going to do. But that isn't really the response that we get from Moses. What we get is a reluctant Moses, a very scared, fearful Moses. And I don't know what it is that exactly brought him to that point, but maybe he just remembered how he failed before. Maybe he remembered some of the struggles. Um, I've been talking to John Westfall about this, and and he brings up the point sometimes that we keep track of our losses a whole lot better than we keep track of our wins. They pile up and we go, man, I can't step into that. I can't do more than that. Maybe he was just worn out. He's grinding, grinding away in a rut of taking care of sheep. And at the end of the day, he's exhausted. Now you want me to go set a nation free? Uh, <laughs> God, I don't, I don't have time or energy for that. I don't think he's all that different from us. He had had amazing moments where he'd seen God work, amazing moments of God's provision in his life. But he also had what we all had, challenges, struggles, things that impacted um, him and changed the trajectory of his life. He had gifts and talents and dreams and hopes, and he had this passion deep inside of him 
and he had a calling to live into something more. But he also had the list of reasons why he couldn't do it. And we too are called by God into a life where we are a blessing. God has prepared good things for us to do. Us to do as a church, us to do together, us to do as individuals. Ephesians 2.10 says that you are God's handiwork. You're made by God, created in Christ to do good works. He's prepared them in advance for you to do. The table is set, and now it's ready to be walked up to. But somewhere in the midst of 40 years of watching the sheep, Moses has lost a little bit of track of that. His calling hasn't changed at all. God hasn't changed at all. But his view of his resources and what he's capable of has greatly changed. I don't say this lightly, and I say it very much to myself, but I think many of us have given up on God in a very profound way. Either because of failures in the past, either because of what we feel like we can't do, uh, because life is hard, or because life is too comfortable, I think sometimes we decide that God needs to use someone else. We settle into a life where we keep up with our favorite shows, we spend a lot of time on Netflix, Christine and I. At least I keep up on my favorite shows. Uh, we go to work, we pursue the American dream of comfort, but we stop living into what it means to be called. We don't even have bandwidth to do that. So what is that? What is that? What is a life well lived? What is the abundant life that Christ is inviting us to? When you picture that on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis, does any images come to mind? You know, maybe it's something big and amazing and it's way out there and you can barely fathom it. When I was doing uh, some college ministry stuff at UPC, there was this one student who was in construction engineering program, uh, construction management, that's what it was. And that's a pretty lucrative industry, especially at the time because a housing crash hadn't happened and all that. And like these students were set to do some amazing things. And then he went out on a mission trip And he came back, and he came back with this vision for what he was going to do. He said, I want to spend six months out of the year going to these third world countries that have buildings that just won't stay standing every time there's an earthquake. And I want to build buildings that actually hold up for the communities there. And then I'm going to spend the other six months traveling around the nation, talking to churches about this and seeing if people will help fund these buildings. Last time I checked on Facebook and last time I was in touch with him, He was continuing to do that. God was bringing that about, and it's great to see these stories that he pops up from who knows where, that he's gone next to build a cool building. That was his vision. But I don't think it has to be big or far away for us to be called. Maybe the calling is the fact that we're married. What does it mean to be the best husband or wife we can be? Maybe the calling is the fact that we're a parent. Maybe the calling is the fact that there is something going on, some injustice in our community that gets to you and you go, man, I wish I could do something about that. Maybe it's the poor. Maybe it's just that job that you go to every week that you don't think too much about, but it's to be the best mechanic or teacher or accountant or whatever it is that you do during the week. Simply do that in such a way that you can be a blessing to other people. Maybe that's what calling is. I do know that God has planted desires in all of us. And I do know that there are things in life that have a tendency to suck that passion out of us. I get it. I do it all the time. There are days where I wake up and I go in the shower and I learn this habit of trying to pray through my day while I'm in the shower about the things that are going to happen. And when I do that well, I show up and I have this attitude of attentiveness and I'm available to the people around me, and I can be my best me, and oftentimes I'm thankful to God for whatever it was that happened that day. Um, But there's also a lot of days where I don't do that, and where I kind of just go, all right, I'm going to make it through this day. And I complain, and I whine about different things, and I'm frustrated. And then God kind of calls on me to do some stuff, and I go, man, I don't want to jump into that. That's uncomfortable. That conversation, that's going to be really uncomfortable and it's kind of intimidating. So could you please just send someone else? Or maybe I will do that later when I have more time or energy for that. That's a good thing to consider doing maybe next week. 
Um, I think I have a small group that I've been plotting in my brain that God has been working with me on that I still can't pull the trigger on, and a lot of it comes around that. Maybe next week's the right time, or after I have a few more conversations about that. Um, I think it's really, really easy to do what Moses did, and to trade this life where we step out in faith and encourage and extend ourselves a little further, and trade that in for something that's more doable. Something that we can do on our own. Moses was perfectly capable of chilling out in the desert and taking care of sheep. He had the resources. He didn't really need God to do that. And then God meets him in a burning bush. He had failed before, and God doesn't let that stop him. He opted for very good reasons to just do what he was doing. But God says there's more. And then God asks that question, what's that in your hand? And what Moses is holding is a perfect picture of his life. It is a stick, more or less. A staff. Some piece of wood that he found. It helps him get around the desert. It gets him through his day. It gets him through his week. But it's not a lot. It's just dead. It's there. And God says, I want you to do something with it. I want you to... Follow me and obey one little thing that I'm going to ask you to do. And, and what I'm going to ask you to do is to throw that stick on the ground. And when he does that, something shifts. It becomes alive. And Moses is changed. Moses had a moment where he could decide not to throw that stick down. He has lots of reasons why he shouldn't. He has fears. He has worries. What if people don't believe me? And he's got all kinds of excuses on why he can't step forward and risk this. And I remember somebody telling me once that there's something special about excuses. You only need one. And if you truly believe it, it can stop you in your tracks. Now, I doubt that you and I get dramatic calls like Moses did from burning bushes. Um, Maybe if we're lucky, we see something smoking like a copier or a computer at work, and that's about as exciting as it gets sometimes. Um, and even then, I haven't ever heard an audible voice from God in the midst of the burning copier. Um, but I think there's calls nonetheless. They're quieter. Maybe even a little more constant, a little more often. You're drawn to a certain issue. You read something that inspires you. You get an idea for some piece of art or or a song, or a story. Just the other day, uh, I was thinking about this, and Christina and I got this message from a friend who had put an offer in on a house and had gotten it, and now was terrified of what that meant. <laughs> Understandable, right? Everyone else congratulates you, and you're like, yay! But really, that's a pretty big deal. We're scared. And Christina got the message, and I was so impressed, because she's usually tired at the end of a day of work, and she said, I need to go talk. So she kind of dropped everything and went over there. But who's to say that isn't what it means to be called? She saw a need, stepped into it, and trusted that God would use her in some way. Somewhere beneath all the data of our lives, all the routines, all the stuff, there's these little tiny opportunities. I want us to think about those opportunities, especially when they line up with the kingdom of God as calling. Maybe it's realizing that we screwed up and apologizing to somebody. Maybe it's realizing we're still holding something against somebody and it's forgiving them. Maybe it's cleaning up some area of our life or just doing one little thing differently this week to be a better husband or wife or friend. Maybe it's a cause. But whatever it is, there's those crucial moments. Do or don't do. Step into it or not. Our tendency is to think that what we have is just what we have. And God doesn't see it that way. He's got resources all around us. The question is, will we step into what God is calling us to do? Even when it's scary, even when it's intimidating, even when it's a stretch. And say, God, how will you show up in this? We have to do it in partnership with God. It has to work that way. We can't do it on our own. I've run off and done lots of things that I was doing for God but I'm not sure I always let God come along. And those experiences have not been good ones. They remind me of a particular trip I took as a Boy Scout when I was a kid growing up. Uh, 
we didn't have lots of stuff and um, we decided to do a big Boy Scout trip. We were going to go hike up Mount Whitney. I'm sure we didn't do the whole thing now that I realize what a little drama I was at the time. But they gave us this list that was like a mile long of stuff you need to do this trip, right? So I go rummaging through the garage and I find some of it. I got bug spray, flashlights, a jacket that would hold up when we got up to the snowy parts. Uh, but I also didn't have a lot of other big things like a 30 degree sleeping bag and a tent. Um, those would be some important things. And had I just set out with that stuff, it would have gotten ugly. Um, I've been reading this news story lately, following it, about this guy who was lost at sea for like two months, I think it was. Uh, yeah, for two months. And he got found on Good Friday. And he was 50 pounds lighter. Amazing that he had survived. He had lived off of like the fish that he had pulled up out of a net. And uh, he kept himself sane by reading his Bible constantly, cover to cover, which uh, I'd probably be more sane if I read my Bible cover to cover regularly. Um, but this guy was just beat up, and I think that's how I would have looked if I had just set out to climb Mount Whitney alone with the stuff that I had in my hands. Luckily, I wasn't a complete idiot, and I was with the Boy Scouts, and so they wouldn't let me quite do that. Um, so I was going to just say, I'm not going on this trip. Can't do it. Don't have it. Um, and my dad said, well, call the Scoutmaster. Tell him what's up, because I know you want to go on the trip. And so I called this guy up, and uh, he said, Give it a couple days, and I'm sure he made some phone calls and probably rummaged through his own garage, and pretty soon I had everything that I needed. And I think that's how it is when we step out into these things that we have opportunities to be a part of, even if it stretches us. When we bring God, tell him about it. See how he gives you what you need for the next step. I think you'll find that the resources are there. That question, what's in your hand? When we follow God with the what's in our hand, what does your life look like? What does your inventory look like? What's your time look like? What's your resources look like? One little step, one little, throw that stick on the ground, do this. Things sprout to life. New life comes. Beautiful things begin to happen. When Moses did that, by the way, there's something that shifts in scripture. Uh, that staff is never called Moses' staff again. It gets a new name. It's the staff of the Lord. How cool does that sound? By the way, here's a couple things that the staff of the Lord did. Uh, along with Moses' staff, all of the uh, signs and wonders and plagues in Egypt that set the Israelites free happened because of that staff. It's an integral part of the stuff. Exodus 17, people are dying in the desert. They are thirsty. And Moses takes the staff of the Lord, no longer just his staff, because now it's connected to something powerful strikes a rock, water flows out of it for a whole community of people to drink. Um, later on in that same chapter, the people are in a battle, and as long as Moses' staff is held up in the air, that staff of the Lord, the people are victorious. And as his arms get tired and he starts to bring some other people around him to support him, good things about the community and why we do church, those arms get back up there and the people win. That staff, that old dead staff, is now a symbol of God's power, a symbol that God is with Moses, doing something for this community of people. That same God who is at work with us, in us, through us, in our stuff, our inventory. So what's in your hand? Whatever it is, it may not look very impressive to you. Remember, Moses thought my speech isn't very impressive. But God says, who made your mouth? Who gave you that talent? Who gave you that ability? Who gives you this time? Who gave you these neighbors? Moses' speaking ability may very well be lacking, but God is not lacking. We aren't the measure of what we think we're capable of. We're the measure of who God is and what he's capable of as long as we put ourselves in his hands. God can see a whole lot better than we can who we are, what we've gone through, the good stuff, our talents and our abilities, as well as the bad stuff, the struggles and the failures and the challenges. And I think God's pretty good at recycling and using all of it to do good things. 
He wants to use every single thing in your mind. So what is it in your hand? What does your staff look like? What is your inventory? Here's a couple areas to consider. Abilities, talents, connections, maybe even setbacks and failures. Maybe it's relational. Maybe you are one of those people who just likes other people. You know how to make friends with people. You actually enjoy small talk. Uh, I know that's hard to believe for some of us. Maybe it's hospitality. You love having people over and hearing their stories. God can use that in powerful ways. It's one of the ways that Christina and I have most been impacted along the way is meet people who say, yeah, come into our house. We want to share our life with you. Maybe it's music or drama or engineering or nursing or fixing a car. I've seen God use all of those things in beautiful ways. But sometimes it's a little tricky. It's a little hard to figure out how God can actually use that. And oftentimes I don't think we even see it because it's just who we are. It's, it's what we do. I work as an admin assistant for this last week, switching out of that role. But uh, we brought on this young lady to help me out because the, the job is just overwhelming to me. And her name is Claire. And... Um, she has one of these memories that doesn't ever forget anything. It's a little bit like Christina. She has a really good memory. She can hold many, many things on her plate at one time. And I drive her absolutely crazy. Because if any of you know me, I'm walking around in this haze of sort of semi-chaotic creative mess. Uh, and things aren't always at the forefront of my mind. I have lots of things that are kind of going and occasionally things slip off the plate. And I try to use lots of helps to help me get them back on the plate. But uh, that's just kind of how I roll. Now, when I talked to Claire about what her gifts or talents are, she was a theater major, so she has lots about that. Like, she knows she's a good performer and can be a good stage manager, and she loves theater, she loves directing. But I've never once heard her say, I really have this gift and ability to organize. It's who she is, it's what she does anytime she's in a space. And I don't think she realizes how much God is using that gift to transform this office that was in sort of chaos that I put it in and make it something orderly and effective. Now, if that's any indi indication of us, we can barely take a compliment sometimes. People say great things about us, maybe we shrug them off. Uh, what are the chances that we're going to actually see our inventory well for the things that are our weaknesses or believe that God can use them? Gifts aren't always miraculous, but they have to get put into action. They have to get extended. <clears throat> Moses sat there, he had a bunch of sheep. I think he was meant for more than a few sheep in the desert. Same skills led people through the desert who were stubborn as anything and who wouldn't have survived without his leadership. I want to close with a, a couple quick stories that might trigger some thoughts about your own inventory. Um, and while I do that, I want to ask you to make sure everybody gets one of so, I'll tell you what to do with them shortly. We haven't done the offering yet because uh, we're going to use these for them. But pass these out while I tell a few stories. If you would. The first one I want to tell is about um, just a talent, a skill. And there's a guy uh, who was a veterinarian, and he kind of got tired of just taking care of people's pets. He wanted to do something more meaningful than take care of rich people's pets. And so he decided, well, maybe I could use my abilities as a missionary. I'm going to go out onto the mission field, and I'm going to go to places where there's poverty and help them keep their animals healthy, because if their animals die, they're in deep financial trouble. So he applied to this mission agency and realized that because of a certain illness that he had, he wasn't going to be able to go out on the mission field. In that moment, he was given a challenge, obstacle to using that gift. And he had the choice to either just shut it down and go back to his normal veterinary practice, or to be creative and find some way to use this. He saw a uh, food bank and said, what would it be like if there was a veterinary clinic that one day out of the week homeless people could bring their pets to and he could take care of them instead? So that was what he decided to do. A little sacrifice, a little shift, and uh, he just out of this desire to use this gift to be a blessing for people around and began to take care of the homeless people's pets. And when he finally passed away, his funeral was packed, packed out, with tons of homeless people and their pets. 
who were largely probably alive because he had just simply used his talents and gifts and abilities to be a blessing to the people around him. Maybe part of the inventory is, is a connection. It's somebody that you want to bring along with you as you do something. I know for me, one of my uh, passions, desires, is to blow up fireworks. I know that's a little bit crazy, and, but I would throw this epic 4th of July party as a good excuse to gather lots of friends around and to indulge my pyrotechnic uh, tendencies. Well, I met this guy while I was having dinner, and he was totally into fireworks too, and he was like, oh, how many fireworks do you buy? And I told him, and he was like, oh, I buy about 10 times that many every year. <laughs> And as a matter of fact, I'm a wholesaler of them. <laughs> <laughs> and we forged this connection around fireworks. And then uh, I decided to throw this party for the well. That was going to be a 4th of July shindig. And we were going to try to bless our neighbors. And we were going to have all of our true people there. And it was going to be this great time of fellowship. And this guy came to mind. And I said, is there any chance I could buy some fireworks from you for this? So every year I buy fireworks from him for this. And, and he said, you know what? Not only can you buy some fireworks from me, I've been planning this show for about six months. I would love to come to it at your party. Right across the street from my house was approximately, I don't know, 30 minutes worth of nonstop staged fireworks. It looked like something out of Gasworks Park, except the wreckage of these giant, exploding, beautiful things was falling on my yard. <laughs> so fantastic. <laughs> A simple connection. Now, I don't know if that's the kingdom of God, but I did know that he was a blessing to me and to my neighbors, and it was a great time. Um, one last story, and this is about weaknesses. Uh, Moses' failure was led to 40 years of sitting around in the desert. That desert time was crucial for the Israelites surviving their time. 2 Corinthians 5.9 says this, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. God uses the wreckage and the brokenness of our lives, especially when we give it to him to extend blessing to other people. That's just how it works. And I don't know what the pain or the brokenness is in your life, but you do. And I, tr I totally believe that God uses that. Rich Walsh, he was a uh, graduate of SBU. He found a career in interior design at the age of 29 he was driving his Jeep, he crashed and was paralyzed from the neck down. He was fitted with a wheelchair that he could steer uh, with his chin and told, you're going to live in a nursing home for the rest of your life. You're going to be on public assistance and your life is pretty much over. Rich decided that he wanted to find a way to live on his own and to work. And that started him on this journey of creating an organization called the Resource Center for the Handicap. And it uh, was dedicated to training folks who had serious handicaps of all sorts to be able to work and to find employment. And when uh, that center closed in 1999, 1,500 people had been trained for work, many of whom had found jobs and were working in major companies. As I think through his story, he had every reason to say, this happened, interior design is gone, my life is done. I can't do anything else. And instead, what he said was, here's who I am. I'm a handicapped guy. But I know how to love some other folks who have handicaps as well. And I want to live on my own, and maybe they do too. So I'm going to figure out a way to love them and to use these gifts. And in God's hands, amazing things happen. When we look over our lives, we see things. Maybe you have some talent or ability. I want you to think about writing that on that card. Maybe you have uh, some connection, some friend that comes to mind that you want to bring along to do something cool. And you don't even know what that is. Think about writing that on that little card that I gave you. Maybe you have a setback in your life that you go, man, this is just shut me down, but I think I'd like to see what God can do with it. And you write that down on the card. And when we take the offering later, I want to gather up all those cards and I want to pray over them this week. I want to discover with you and to walk with you as you find what God wants to do with all this stuff that's in your hand that you don't even know what God can do with it. So, that's my invitation to you right now. 
one last little thought. Um, what Moses had didn't look like much. It was a stick in the desert. And somehow God used it to set a nation free when he put it in God's hands. What do you think that he could do with us? And I know that when you look at yourself, if you're anything like me, maybe what you see doesn't feel like much. But I also know that when God looks at you, he sees a whole lot more. He sees everything about who you are, everything that you bring to the table. And you are amazing and powerful people, even without his help, let alone in his hands. He can do amazing things. So in these next weeks, in this next week, hopefully, very tangibly, you can find a way to step into this thing called calling. You don't have to have it all figured out. Just say, God, here I am. Use this. Show me the thing. So, with that, let's pray. And then we'll have the worship team come up and we'll take the offering. Lord, Thank you that you're a big God who can do big things and that what you want to do is beautiful and a blessing in the world. And Lord, we want to put ourselves in your hands. So, so take what it is that it may not feel like much. The little bits that we are, the good stuff, the brokenness, the friends that we have, the neighborhood we live in, the neighborhood we worship in. Lord, take all of this stuff and do what you want to do. Show us something tangible that we can do this week to offer our lives to you. Thanks for being so good and for loving us so much.